the music you listen to says a lot about who you are. In this podcast, we discuss how that music may shape your life. We talk to normal people with a love for music and people that are in the music industry in one form or another. My name is Craig Seibert, and we want to know your music story. Welcome to Music Musing. Welcome back to Music Musing. Uh, I have a guest tonight, Mike Sloat. So Mike Sloat is a director. Um, he is a director of a lot of types of videos. So I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, but Mike actually came into a connection from my last guest, actually. Luis uh, Malbus was my last guest, and he kind of put us in touch with each other. Um, and looking through his website, mikesloat.com, definitely in the same vein of music I am. Uh, looks like you definitely got a music history that we can talk about. Um, Mike, thanks for being on. Appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So let's, uh, let, let's, I, I kind of do this every single time. I usually jump around a little bit, but I usually I'll start right at the beginning. Um, obviously music's been in your life. Uh, you play music, I assume. I mean, since you're oh, a luthier yeah. <laughs> sort of, okay. Yeah. Um, where did music start with you? Did it start with a family? Did it start like, were you sitting in the you know little living room listening to records? Did you have a family member that kind of brought you into it? Where did you, it, would you what's your earliest memories of music? Um, I think it started kind of out of the blue, at least playing music. It kind of started out of the blue where um, my brother and his friend who were in fifth or sixth grade, they must've been in sixth grade. I was in fourth grade. Okay. They went to this music teacher to get some instruments and start playing trumpet, I think. And I went with them and uh, the woman was like, oh, you should play trombone. <laughs> like, okay, what is that? And, you know, like, okay, I'll try it. And, uh, and I really liked it and I turned out to be pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, and I stuck with it, you know, all through elementary school into junior high until I learned, you know, I, I got an electric guitar in ninth grade and then trombone was gone at that point. <laughs> was, was it, was it the coolness factor? Cause I even talked about this with, with uh, one of my other guests too, that, that it always feels like I play trumpet as well, just so I can kind of relate a little bit. I always felt like when I got to high school that it just wasn't cool enough for me to do anymore. Once I saw somebody else playing guitar, was it that same way for you or did, did you just kind of naturally migrate out of it? No, it was an instant thing. I, I got my first guitar, I got my first guitar uh, from my parents and it was broken. It had a crack in the neck. Uh, so we took it back. We took it back on my birthday uh -huh. to the, the music store and um, put my birthday money together with the money back from the guitar and got this amazing, you know, Ibanez red pointy guitar. And that was, I just go back to trombone after that. Are you kidding me? There was no way it was ridiculous to even think about it. So you actually, you had family members um, kind of bring you into it, but uh, did you have yeah. anything, do you, do you remember, have any memories of like listening to music with your, your, your parents or your uncles, or did you ever have that, that experience where you kind of, I don't know, were fed music at a younger age? Um, yeah, kind of. I remember like we, my family has a, a cabin up in the wilderness up in Trinity County. And we would always listen to like uh, the Beatles, Fleetwood Mac, uh, Alan yeah. Parsons, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's my earliest memory of music. I think of listening to a full album over and over all the way up to our cabin. You know? Yeah. That doesn't get done much anymore either where you just kind of mm -hmm. throw it on and, and absorb it. Kids are so, yeah put a song on, move to the next band, move to the next band, move to the next band nowadays. And yeah. I think at, I, I've, I've noticed that a lot of people that are both players, music, you know, musicians, and the people that are really kind of into music a lot deeper than other people, that's kind of where they started. They had that, that time where they were sitting down and with family members and going through something and, and literally mm -hmm. start, you know, side one, flip it over, play side two. I can remember my parents doing Dr. Hook and the medicine show, just starting putting it on <laughs> listening and then flipping it over and going to the next side and just over and over again. Um, yeah. So w when your brother was influencing you, you said he was already playing or was he kind of starting at the same time? Uh, we started at the same time. Okay. So did yeah. he gravitate towards guitar as well or? 
he I think he actually played guitar first. Oh, okay. Um, I think he and his friend, same friend that played trumpet, I think they started taking guitar lessons together and then something, I don't know what happened. I think that was like an independent thing from school and yeah. then school came around and they wanted to be in the school band. So they picked up trumpet instead. And um, and what were the music influences at that time? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Okay. So I'm going to get comfortable. Give me the list. <laughs> I have no, no, I have no idea. Oh, uh, that was maybe like back then that was fourth grade, fifth, sixth grade. Yeah. Uh, whatever we were playing in, in band, it was the theme to star Wars or, uh, ghostbusters or, you know, random, just random stuff. Baby elephant walk by Henry Mancini. Oh, wow. That's taking me back. I hadn't thought about that in forever. Um, but as far as guitar, what kind of influenced you in starting to play? Oh, um, let's see. Probably, I think I really, the first music I really got into was Van Halen, Quiet Riot, uh, Rat, Scorpions, stuff like that. I think actually Van Halen and Scorpions are probably the two big big influences that i started with that's some serious guitar influences there i mean you're talking about guys yeah. that that are definitely seasoned and have their own style um oh, yeah. did you try and emulate i mean did you were you tapping like a, a right away or uh yeah a little bit i've never uh, really tried to play like eddie van halen i just uh and i never really i know maybe two Van Halen songs. I never really wanted to learn them because I just wanted them to be perfect and amazing and untouchable for some reason. So I never, I know like Unchained or maybe Panama and that's about it. I never tried to learn anything for some reason. It sounds like you have a deep respect for, for recorded music. And I guess that kind of ties into what you do know a little bit now. Um, how do you, what do you feel about live albums? Do you feel that's a, that's a stretch for music or live is, albums, live albums. Yeah. Um, you know, actually I think the first Scorpions album I bought was worldwide live. Wow. <laughs> I think that was the first one I ever actually purchased. And then I went back from there. That was brand new. Yeah. When I got into the Scorpions and I was like, these guys are amazing. And then I went back from there. I think Ozzy Osbourne too. Ozzy had, um, that tribute album that was all live. Oh yeah. Yeah. Was- I think that was an early, early one for me too. So you kind of uh, then then skip back and listen to the recorded stuff. Yeah, and then it was like I was so used to the live version, I was like, oh, that's what a studio version of that sounds like. Do you find yourself doing that now too, like f- picking up a band and then saying, "Man, I can't believe I missed these guys. I should go back and listen." Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm just saying it because I I I wasn't a huge Ramones fan all my life you know the songs are out there I, i've heard them every once in a while but i actually went back and started listening to like the full albums and i was a little mm-hmm. shocked how i felt like most of the stuff that they play on the radio was bubblegum pop like it wasn't really oh. you know something deep or, or meaningful that was just really you know kind of just play it fast and get it out there but listen to some of their yeah. other stuff i was a little shocked how deep their stuff really is some of their own really want. yeah some of their yeah. older albums same with the deftones i mean i I, I'm been a Deftone fans for years, but I never went back and listened to their early stuff, and that kind of hit me really weird. So, oh. uh, okay, so you're playing music. Uh, did it progress into a band? Did you play with a band? Did you play on stage? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what did we do? Yeah, we. <laughs> I was playing Scorpions and Van Halen songs <laughs> and Rat songs, and then um, ninth grade, I started. I guess that's when I started playing was in ninth, like 15 years old. I started playing, you know, guitar and then heard other people were playing and we started sort of playing together. Yeah. But then in, when I was a sophomore is when we actually tried to form a band with, you know, guitar players, drums, bass, and started playing with uh, a drummer pretty regularly, Yeah. which was mind blowing back then, like hearing a live beat going to your guitar was like oh my god i remember the first time we set up my parents had this barn in the backyard and we would set up in one of the rooms in the back and i invited my buddy scott who i still play with now um to come play with me and this drummer and i was watching him 
to, to watch his expression on his face when the drums kicked in. And I saw the same thing on his face that I felt when I first played with That's him. Awesome. It was just like this huge realization of, oh, wow. I don't even know what it is. I can't even describe it really. I don't know what it was, but it was this I can mind blowing. I can seriously relate. The guy that I I played with, we played at coffee houses and stuff for acoustic for a while, and we were covering like Pearl Jam and stuff at that time. And the same story though, I, I met a guy where I worked, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I play drums." I'm like, "Well, come over and play." And we just we started playing our stuff, and he was the type of guy who listened a little bit before he actually jumped in to put a drum beat to it. We were writing originals, and when he started playing, it's like, oh, this is our music with drums. What do I do yeah. here? <laughs> it blows right. it away. It's crazy. So you guys were playing outside, like in the weather? No, no. We we, oh, okay. uh, we had this uh, this barn, this old, and my parents have this piece of property that was in the middle of an orchard uh, for a hundred years. Yeah. And then it was, they built a subdivision all around us. But we we had like an acre, almost an acre of property with a house and a big barn. Yeah, um, that was all enclosed. And my dad like finished two rooms in the back. One was going to be his office. Yeah, and he let us have it for band rehearsal nice. instead. For a year, so. Yeah, that's cool. awesome. Uh, yeah, so was, band, you so where did, did you guys play out? Did you play some local clubs? Well, that band, um, that band was just like jamming together. And, you know, we were just messing around. And then um, that was sophomore year. So junior year, uh, I met, well, an old friend of mine started playing bass. We started writing songs, uh, heard about a drummer, a guitar player, and informed this this metal band. Okay. Um, and then we started, then my, so we practiced for like a year, wrote some really terrible songs, <laughs> and then started playing uh, parties and clubs just here and there and nothing is it, but, but you liked it i mean that was something that you wanted to do is it something uh, yeah yeah playing yeah we played i think the first first gig was a party yeah and it was absolutely packed i mean we were jammed into this corner and it was completely packed and you know we finished that and i was like that was that was pretty fun you know that's kind of cool let's try to get a club gig yeah and we were 17 years old yeah and, um there's this club uh called shooters west i don't know what that means but um <laughs> it was the place to play in in santa rosa okay and uh somehow this this guy do you do you remember the the metal band vicious rumors yeah yes <laughs> wow that's going back <laughs> yeah yeah i mean they're like 70s early 80s yeah um, and they're still around but um, the guitar player, Jeff, was booking this place when we were trying to get a gig. And our drummer was friends with him, kind of. And, you know, he pulled the, the whole, okay, look, kid, you know, I'll give you this one gig, but you, you, you got to sell it out. It go. <laughs> yeah, you got you to sell tickets. And uh, I know you, that can't story. Anyone, you can't tell anyone you're 17. <laughs> Don't drink. But it was cool, man. <laughs> My my mom and my aunt brought all their friends with them. <laughs> That's funny. Took pictures. And it was terrible. It was they, really. They, they like stopped you and make made you take pictures of the band together and stuff. And they didn't. But oh. uh, we had at the time we had a guitar player that was so bad. He was so terrible. And I was singing and playing. Our drummer was playing and singing. Yeah. And we swapped songs back and forth, and it just felt like a mess. It just felt like a mishmash of weird you know what are we doing um but that band went on for like three years i think and uh eventually scott who i play with now who was the bass player i first played with yeah came back into that band um and we kind of got it together towards the end but then our you know drugs and girlfriends and all the stupid stuff <laughs> came into play and it just fell apart that that that's I could probably say that more bands that could have made it were broke up by the stories you just said <laughs> by yeah. drugs, women, you know, yeah. getting mad at each other, you know, throwing stuff, and I, I can right. I can definitely relate to that. Um, so your 
are are you at that point in time? I assume at that age, you're probably still living at home. You're start, probably still, you know, oh, yeah. like, when you got got out on your own, was that something that kind of put a stop to you playing, or did you actually continue playing? Have you always continued playing? No. Yeah, the only time I stopped playing was, um, let's see. So I graduated graduated from high school in '89. Okay. Um, went to the junior college here in Santa Rosa, and then started film school in 1994 okay um so i ended up moving to san francisco while and i was still in a band um but it just it was just too much driving back and forth and so i took a break for i think it was 17 years um from being in a band and then at one point i i think actually when i started film school around 94 i sold my big you know half stack yeah and just put my guitars away I had a little practice amp, but I rarely pulled it out, you know? Um, yeah. So that was like a 17 year break. But and before that, even, you know, when that metal band ended, um, me and, you know, half of that band got together with half of a punk rock band and made this new thing that was a blast that we did for like three years that, um, you know, we just didn't care. There was no pressure because we didn't care what we were doing. We didn't care what we sounded like. We didn't care where we played or if we played. We just had fun. Um, and, you know, so that was a blast. I feel like there's that's you've just described also like every first album for, for great bands. And then it kind of progresses to where they don't have as much fun anymore. And man, I miss, yeah. I miss that feel. And I, I, it, that kind of sticks in your veins. That music kind of just yeah. sticks in your veins that you wrote back then. And I think that's why I personally have a hard time letting go of all the songs I wrote when I was a kid even though they're horrible they're, I don't, I, you know, I put them on the cassettes. I put the cassettes in the little cassette player and listen to it. I'm like, this is horrible. Why did I listen to this? But I wrote it. <laughs> it's my music. We had fun. We right. did it and we had fun. Um, yeah. So you went to f film school, you have yeah. your producer, you produce <laughs> music videos, uh, wine, food, and beverage uh, for nonprofits. You do uh, eat. Okay. Let's talk about the, the, uh, how we kind of connected here. Luis and is in the learning development field. I am as well. And you do a lot of videos for e-learning for, um, yes. conferences and, um, it, small events and conferences and everything like that. How did you get into that side of it? We'll talk about the music side in a minute, but how'd you get into the L and D side of it? I love creating a music music podcast. It lets me see how music affects people in different ways. We're always looking for interesting guests, so if you know someone in the music industry or someone who really has a great music-related story, reach out to us at musicmusicfeedback at gmail.com. This podcast is produced out of my pocket, so if you want to help with that process, we also have a Patreon at patreon forward slash music musing. You can join for as little as a dollar a month, and we have some cool behind-the-scenes pictures and stories, and even a sticker. You could even co-host a show idea that you have rolling around in your head. And lastly, please leave us a great review on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts on. It helps us reach out to more people who may enjoy these conversations. Thank you for your time and back to the Music Music Podcast. Luis. <laughs> okay. Luis and I, so, uh, so, okay, let me go back a little bit. Okay. So the metal band ended. Okay. Um, we started this hardcore, you know, semi-punk band that lasted you know, three ish years. Okay. It was really fun. During that same time, probably 92, I think, um, the drummer from that band met Luis. Um, one of them was working at a video store <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> met the other one. I forget who was working. I think Luis was working at the, at a video store. Okay. Um, and met the drummer I was playing with and, uh, and he was like, Oh, you know, I met this guy. He wrote, he writes songs and, so Luis and his friend Daryl came to our house one day and we got together and um, ended up, you know, playing a little bit, recording a little bit. But um, I think it was personalities and stuff just didn't yeah. click so good. Um, but Luis became a really good friend. Good. And uh, my wife and I got married in 93 and he, you know, played a song that I had written at our wedding. Wow. We got, yeah, we got to be really close friends pretty, pretty quick. Awesome. Um, 
So you guys have so, been friends for a really long time. I didn't realize it was yeah. that much of a, of a distance between the, the start of the friendship and now. That's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah I'm pretty sure it was 92. So we're going on 30 years. Yeah, 30 yeah. Years it is. So in, in weaving in with with what he was doing, you kind of just naturally flew it. Flew, uh, you know, you're, you you started doing the e-learning stuff because he kind of did as well. But Yeah, so he was, he was uh, the first employee at the e-learning guild. Yep, yep. Um, and, and helped build it. And around 2009, when their conferences were getting bigger, um, he said, you know, do you want to come and film and do interviews and that kind of stuff? And so DevLearn 2009 was my first um, e-learning guild event. And I've done, I think there's only been one or two that I've missed since then, yeah. since 2009. Well, so, but to tie that back into the real deal that I want to talk about is the music side of it. And you know, I've, I've watched a couple of your videos and I'm, I've grew up a Testament fan. My brother and I were both pretty big into metal, um, at the time. And, you know, early Testament stuff is amazing. Just Alex Skolnick is, is an amazing guitar player. Um, but you produce videos for a lot of different genres. Um, I saw that, you know, there was a country song on there. I saw there was a, I don't know, is it rockabilly kind of on there <laughs> as well? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, music is a part of your life, so that kind of was a natural pull to you. But how, how did you get there? How, how, what's the progression in you taking that music love and putting that video, you know, profession that you've got going and put those two together? Um, I took uh, I took a you know I was going to the junior college and and trying to I was taking music classes, art classes. But I just I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I was completely lost. I I thought I was going to be a graphic artist and I turned out I hated it. It was horrible. Um, so I took a year off and just didn't go to school and was right. I was just writing stories. Yeah. And I kind of realized one day, well, wait, if I, I think I borrowed a friend's video camera and I was running around just shooting stuff. And I was like, well, wait, I like to make music, draw, um, tell stories. Maybe filmmaking can take all of that stuff I can do animation, I can do whatever and, and combine everything. And I was like, well, wait, music videos too. And um, so I took a few classes at the junior college. I was like, this is very cool. Looked into film school and just, it, it took off from there. And um, yeah, that was 90, 94. I started film school. I finished in 97 and already had a production company going. We had, um, I met four guys in film school that were kind of, we were all like-minded and, we started a production company and had a really cool office in San Francisco. And, um, you know, we thought we would be a, a, like a directing collective where a project comes in and we all kind of have something to, but didn't work so good. We all wanted to be our own, you know, <laughs> our own independent director. And, um, but it was cool for a while, but, um, yeah, around like 2002, I saw it wasn't really working. And I really wanted to concentrate on music videos. So I told them, you know, I was going to go do my own thing. They decided they wanted to just shut down. Um, so we shut down the company and my wife and one daughter at the time and I moved to LA and did music videos for three years down there. So how did you get into finding people that, that needed it? Was it just like ad in the paper type thing or did, um, because you were a musician, did you kind of know where to go and... No, I didn't at all. Okay. I, I wasn't really, that was during the time that I was not playing. This is like 2002, 2003. Okay. I didn't know what was happening in any music scene at all. Okay. Um, I remember I, I uh, when we had decided to close our production company, um, I needed to build my demo reel, my video demo reel. And um, I was like, okay, where, <laughs> I don't know anybody who plays. I called up. Luis yeah. and two of our other friends and said, who's, you know, who's a good band in, in Santa Rosa. You know, I wanted to keep it small and just pick two or three bands and do something really cool. Yeah. And, um, all three of them, Luis, I called him first cause he was still, you know, active yeah. and he said, Oh, this band, the velvet teen. And then our friend Joey said the same thing. Our friend Ben said the same thing. So I just looked him up back then. I looked him up on MySpace and just sent a message randomly and they were like yeah we'll do a video and so i paid for the whole thing and then um i put an ad up somewhere 
I don't remember where, but I ended up getting two more bands right around the same time um, and just did a video for them and, and built my reel like out of nowhere, kind of quick within a few months. And then you just kind of started shopping it. Well, I, before I go yeah. that direction, um, obviously the history that you have with music, both listening and playing helps you kind of be in tune with what they're looking for. And I think, yeah. yeah so I think, um, you know, kind of explain how that, how that fed into you getting, talking to them or, you know, kind of letting them know, Hey, I, I, I've been where kind of where you are, I can kind of help out. And I've also got this talent. Is, is that kind of how it went or? No, <laughs> Way no it was like, I think I picked like, young young bands that didn't know what they were doing and didn't it's totally opposite was it (laughs) yeah i i I was like hey i i went to film school and i'm building a demo reel you want a free video and they were like yes because you know there's no risk they didn't have to pay for anything that's true so if it turned out terrible they just won't use it you know i mean it was literally like i'm just putting this on my demo reel if it goes beyond that whatever so did that, but th- did those type of things get you into the next door? I mean, did that kind of move you up to those next people looking to, for you or, or saying, Hey, I, maybe I want this guy or re- are you still kind of chasing things down? Um, still chasing things down. Oh, okay. So that's like 2002. I spent about a year, I don't know, about six months building my demo reel. Okay. Once I had a demo reel, uh, I went to LA and stayed with, um, a friend of mine that was one of my partners at the production company, he had already moved to LA and was, you know, he was doing big V he was doing, you know, Courtney love and Kanye West (laughs) videos. So he let me stay with him for a few weeks while I made demo reels. And literally (laughs) back then demo reels were made. They were recorded on three quarter inch tape. They weren't even DVDs yet. They were these giant tapes. Yeah. Um, so I set up a whole dubbing station in his little studio and dubbed tapes for a couple days and then walked around and drove around, you know, Hollywood, Culver City, everywhere, um, handing out these three quarter inch tapes to probably 50 or 60 different production companies just trying to get signed as a director. Wow. Um, so I did that for two weeks. I was down there for like two weeks and went home. And didn't hear anything from for like two weeks. And I was like, all right, I better find some stupid job. (laughs) But then offers started coming in. People were calling me and saying, oh, we got your demo reel. And, and, you know, we'd like to talk. And um, that was really, really exciting. That was like, you know, the equivalent of being assigned a band um, was I was having these huge production companies calling me saying, hey, we want you to come down and talk to you. And. Um, so I set up like four meetings and went back down. This is probably, this is 2002. So, um, I went back down and, uh, met like four different production, like big production companies. They were amazing. They had such great directors. Yeah. And somehow I, I got talked into going with this terrible company (laughs) that did nothing for me. I don't know what I was thinking. They like, we came down to LA and uh, they, they invited my wife and daughter and I up to their house in Calabasas, this big house up on the hill, amazing views and just wowed us with, you know, the fact that the owner of the production company lived there. He built, you know, this custom house because of music videos. And um, at the time, there's so much to this story. I'm <laughs> trying to narrow it down. We, we got another 30 um, minutes. So. <laughs> we, we, the uh, Napster had made a huge impact on, on the music industry, yeah. money-wise, right? Yeah. Um, downloading. The first hit that, that happened in the music industry was marketing budgets. And specifically, music video budgets. Oh, man. they were tanking. They were going from hundred thousand dollars for an average video to five or ten thousand dollars. Wow, um, that's a big. So difference. I was coming from a place where I'm making these music videos for these young guys in Northern California for a thousand bucks, easy, and I had serious. You know, I, I could do it. I could do it for practically nothing. So all these production companies were saying, "We want you to come in and be our low budget guy, and then you'll move up from there." Um, 
this production company that I ended up signing with were like, well, why do you want to do that? when we're just going to make you our number one guy right now, we're going to get you huge budgets. And, and we were like, Oh, really? that sounds better. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were terrible people. They didn't end up doing anything for me. Um, so obviously you got out of that because I got, I spent about eight months with those guys until another company offered a much better deal. And I went with them and um, they got me a few things, but I, I ended up g- like going through this process of looking for a production company, signing with someone, getting my first big job with them, and then they go out of business. <laughs> like all these. Ep- what was the Back times? Then, I mean, that was the times, unfortunately, yeah. like you said. The yeah, music totally. industry was was changing so drastically with. Like you said, with with easily pirating music or downloading music, videos yeah. were kind of being cut. MTV was turning more towards you know different stuff than than videos. So you're right; it was just a bad time at, at that point. But yeah, I w- I hit it at the exact wrong time. <laughs> I should have been born ten years earlier and done my thing in the '80s and '90s. Because uh, yeah, I can't believe like how bad my timing was just across the board, um, especially with the companies that I picked because. So many of them just like all the cliches of filmmaking and the music industry were totally true because they were just a bunch of scumbags that, you know, started a company, made a bunch of money and then got in trouble. So they disappeared (laughs) and you couldn't track them down. Every like all four production companies I was with went out of business in the middle of me doing a job, owing me money. Oh, man. I had to finish, you know, I wanted to stay in good with the record companies right. so i had to finish the job yeah but then i don't get paid yeah that's it was it was bullshit is what it was so, it was so frustrating so so but you're still working with the bands you're still getting into a position where you're actually working with the bands and talking with them directly you get yeah. to kind of feel out their songs i mean obviously you're going to get the song you're going to listen to it kind of get an idea for writing something but so how much input do they usually give you? Or is it kind of vary between bands? Oh, it's yeah. It's totally different from one band to another. Oh, really? Some bands. Yeah. Some bands come like, I've done a lot of work with this band machine head. Yeah. It's all on there. They, they, uh, Rob, the, the singer almost always has at least some kind of little nugget of, I want it to be this. Okay. Um, and then we go from there and throw out a bunch of ideas and pare it down to what, what it should be uh-huh. um, other bands. I just worked with this guy, Scott Mickelson, who um, he had this great song. He's very um, folky sort of Americana and he had no idea what he wanted to do. And we just talked and talked and talked and worked out this weird concept. Um, other bands, you know, say, Hey, can we do, can we do this? And then we just make it up as we go. We start at one place and we just have done that so many times. I was just telling, um, we shot a Machine Head video last week uh-huh. here in Santa Rosa. And Rob, the singer, was like, I don't have a lot of ideas. I kind of want to do this, this, and this. But I feel like we should just start and just do it <laughs> and just see what happens. And my partner, Jason, and I, we that's how we work best. We work really well under pressure just by the seat of our pants. It's ridiculous. And is that the way, is that the way you like it? Or do you like the, them coming to the table with a lot of direction? I don't like it. Uh, (laughs) It's, it's better when they have an idea. Okay. Start with at least that we can expand on. Um, When it's not like that, it it gets a little dicey as far as what I'm going to do as a director. Is it going to match what they write their concept? in their head, right? Yeah, whether they know it or not, or want to admit it, there is a vision for it in their head. Yeah. They're just, it's not fully formed yet. So if they give me that nugget that I, and I'm going to run with that, it's, it might not match, you know, yeah. what they want. And then you get that too far down the line and it's almost too late to really, you know, jump yeah. back and come closer to their vision. So do you kind of work iterative like that where you kind of work with them as you go and say, hey, is this working out? Are we going in the right direction or are you just still kind of wing it? <laughs> Um, yeah, that happens. Yeah. I mean, it's different. Like you said, yeah, it's different for each one. <laughs> yeah. You never know. Like I've, 
in the last year, actually during the pandemic, um, I've done almost all only music videos. I don't know why. I mean, because, you know, some of the corporate clients went away because they didn't, right. they couldn't do events and stuff. So, um, but music video production has shot way up for me. Um, and I've had a handful where, you know, they're like, we don't know what we want to do. Okay, what if we do this? And we get all the way to the end and they don't want a single change. Like that's happened so like, much yes. in the last few years. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It's the greatest thing. It's the greatest day of my life when a band says, yeah, it's not. I said, uh, I did this animated video, this stop motion video. <laughs> I saw that one. I was going to ask you about that one. <laughs> yeah, the bracket one. Yeah. And uh, I sent it to them and I put my voice on there as their voices uh-huh. for the beginning and end and uh, just to rough it out so they could see what it was like. And I sent it to them and the file was called, you know, bracket, forget, rough cut. Yeah. And they got it and they're like, it's great. Why does it say rough cut? <laughs> <laughs> well it could be done if you want it to be done like that but do you want it they're like no i'm like well i don't want my voice on there let's record your voice so they're like no it's funny let's leave your voice <laughs> okay you know so I, I watched it and i heard the voice i'm about to go back and listen to it again now that i've actually spoke with you and see see what, what you're talking about but so have you ever had to reel anybody back in though like hey you're you're, you're going way further than you need to go with this idea <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. How many times have you had to reel? <laughs> no. Is there yeah. one that stands out that you can think of? Oh yeah. <laughs> Do we want to uh, mention it? <laughs> um. Oh man. Well, so I've done a lot of we the machine head videos that we did that we did last week. Yeah. Um, I think that's my like thirteenth video, twelfth or thirteenth video with them. Okay. I've been working with them for almost 20 years. Next year will be 20 years we've been working. Wow. Together. Um, and 2014, 2015, um, I don't know. I think maybe they were going through a rough patch creatively or personally or something. Okay. But, um, the video, the video we did for, for that album, um, it was called now we die was the video. Okay. Um, it started out as Rob, the singer, just throwing a bunch of ideas out and I'm writing them down. Oh, this is a stupid, complicated story too. Um, <laughs> That's what this this, was, this whole podcast is about, love, about those types of stories. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to admit something here that I don't think I've told anyone. Um, so I was, so that's 2014, I think it was. Um uh chuck billy from testament yep. was starting he was starting a management company and he was going to manage exodus the band exodus yeah and Toxic um, Waltz. Remember he, that song. <laughs> he, yeah he and his wife were going to do that and um chuck called me i had already done the testament one testament video uh-huh. and chuck called and said hey let's do an exodus video and i'm like yes, yes. <laughs> awesome i would love to do that um long story short i ended up not getting the video they chose someone else and I was really bummed and kind of pissed off. Yeah. And, uh, and um, right around then, I was going to retire from music videos. I don't know why I was sick of it or something. But Rob from Machine had called me. He's like, hey, we need to do a video. And I was like, all right, I'm going to show Exodus what they missed out on. <laughs> That's awesome. So I did this. This I did. I took the Machine Head video out of spite, basically, which was <laughs> not a good idea. And... Um, Rob was throwing all these ideas at me and I'm writing them down. Okay, we can do this. Okay. And for some reason, I thought I could just rent a, a studio and do this all myself. I could get a couple actors. I'll shoot the band. I'll use my own lighting. And then it got absolutely enormous. We need Nazis with guns <laughs> and gas masks. We need naked dancers with gas masks with snakes. We need a Wait, girl. Is this a tool her- video or? <laughs> It was so much stuff. The list got bigger and bigger and bigger. And like four days before the shoot, I called up my partner that I produce a lot of stuff with. Yeah. And his wife, his wife is um, sort of a behind the scenes producer for us. And I was like, I'm in over my head. And I need help. And they helped me sort of get it together and get a crew together. And uh, <laughs> we were supposed to shoot for two days. 
at this studio in Oakland, uh-huh. Soundwave Studios. And uh, the end of the first day, it was like, whoa, we have a lot to shoot tomorrow. Let's see if we can get through it. End of the second day, I'm like, we're not going to finish. There's no way. And we're out of money. Oh. So I talked to Rob and the manager, and they're like, uh, okay, well, let's add a third day tomorrow. I'm like, oh, oh my God. no. <laughs> like, it was it basically, we ended up doubling the budget and doubling the shoot days. Oh, wow. And it got so out of hand. Like, it, it was like, I. I Doing it out of spite to show this other band, look what you missed on, was just the worst idea because I dropped the ball from beginning to end. It was like I had never made a music video before. I forgot to call people. I forgot to remind people. I forgot so many things that came back to bite me in the ass. It was so bad. Um, It was the most stressful time of my life. Like those four days, we did three days in a row. We took a few days off and then did a fourth day. Yeah. So it was like six-ish days altogether. Yeah. Um, my wife was like, I'm worried about you. I think you're <laughs> going to have a heart attack because it was it was so bad. I was flipping out over so many different things. And uh, long story, long story long, <laughs> um, it ended up being an awesome video. I was gonna, that was my next question is, it, did it turn out good? <laughs> I love the video. It's um, it's a lot of stuff just always happening. It's just so many different things. The Nazis, the naked girls, um, a queen getting her head chopped off for some reason. Uh, our friend Artok painted head to toe red like the devil, leading a guy on a chain and hanging the band upside down by their feet from the rafters of this studio. And It's so much. It's a, it's a really long song. Which song is um, it? Now we die. Okay. Oh, it's the one that's on your site. I think it's on. Yeah, there. yeah, I think so. I think I saw that one on there. It's worth watching. It's it's pretty awesome. Actually, both machine head videos that are on the site are, are worth watching. They're pretty cool. They're kind of the same vibe. It's just a lot of weird, meaningful stuff happening one after the other. <laughs> it's craziness. Um, that those, those are the stories I live for, though. I love hearing stuff like that. Um, oh my god, it was did, a nightmare. Did, it was did so bad. but did did. Experiences like that and experiences like working with um, some of these bands that either had a vision or didn't have a vision, did did it make you want to, did it push you to music more or did it push you away from music from, from doing this? Did it kind of get you in that mood where you wanted to listen to more stuff or did it get you in that mood where you really just kind of wanted to separate yourself from it because it was technically work? I don't think it made me want to, I don't think it really changed my opinion okay. of music or my love of music at all. Um, it probably made me not want to do any metal videos for a while. That that specific, you know, <laughs> that, that one incident forced you not. To. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I no, I don't think it changed much for just the love of music overall. So I I usually jump to three questions, but I have one more thing I want to talk about. You recently have started being a luthier. You've started. I I couldn't tell if it, I, I was watching some of the videos. Have you actually started teaching yourself or have you also had like a mentor? No, no. I just, um, I, when we were living in LA, um, I got back into playing music. Yeah. So, uh, again, machine head, they came to me and they, they shot this live DVD. This is 2005. They shot a live DVD at Brixton Academy in, in, uh, London and sent me the footage and wanted me to edit this like, 15 song, you know, live concert DVD. Yeah. So I was editing that, uh, in my little office in LA. And every time I finished a song, a video of a song, I would need to export it. And I'd have 20, 30 minutes, you know, to, to, you know, clean the house or do something. And I got my guitars out and I started noodling around a little bit and playing again. Um, and around the same time, I, uh, my dad's always been, a um, uh, a woodworker. Oh, okay. So I know a lot. I know a lot, you know, oh, you got a little bit of a history then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I started kind of, you know, thinking about getting a new guitar and I was like, well, how hard is it to build a guitar? <laughs> so, so I ended up ordering parts from like all around the world. They came from everywhere. Um, and I built a Telecaster and I was like, well, that was pretty easy. I know how to do woodworking. This is like really basic, you know, cutting out shapes. Yeah 
and routing and, you know, basic geometry, basic physics, I could probably figure it out. Um, so then we moved back up here from LA. We moved up here in 2006. And uh, that winter I started building, um, I always wanted a flying V. I never had one. And uh, I thought, well, it's, you know, it's easy. It's a big V, you know, yeah. get the wood. And so I just, I kind of learned it on my own. I watched tons of YouTube videos, and, yeah. um, read articles and stuff, but just kind of learned as I went. And is that Which kind I'm of, still doing that, was, that kind of also pr- grown your appreciation for the craft? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I, cause I noticed you're, I, you have a lot of flying bees now I saw in the pictures. Um, mm-hmm. I noticed they're, they're, they're made on necks. They're not bolt-ons, which is, I don't I remember if the original traditional flying V's from Gibson, were they, those were bolt-ons or were those? No, those, they were glued in. They were neck through. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I, I'm kind of doing the same idea with mine. I'm refinishing a guitar that I, my, basically my first guitar that I purchased when I was young, I've stripped it down and I'm kind of refinishing it myself. And I think there's, quite a bit of difference between creating a guitar and and refinishing a guitar, but there's so much involved in it. There's so much, so many little things that can go wrong when you're talking about a piece of wood that if something comes off of it, it never comes back. Like it's not, you know, Mm, for the most part, (laughs) you can, you can do some fixes and and stuff here and there, but it's just so, but it's so, um, I don't know what's the word, what's the word I'm looking for. It is so, um, it's so beautiful to put your hands on something that you've created and to be able to make music with that as well. Oh, yeah. Like when you put totally. something together, like a model or something, it's kind of cool to look at, but when you put something together that also makes music, that's like, that's 10 times above, yeah. you know, that's, that's dedication oh, yeah. to music. You got music in your blood at that point. So, Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm looking at four flying, five flying V's right here. Now. <laughs> I was going to say, I think when I saw the pictures, I'm like, man, he really likes the flying V's. There's quite a bit of them in there. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I got kind of obsessed with them. I'm, I'm a little obsessed with the uh, the Eddie Van Halen uh, style now. I, the I, style. I did watch the video of you making the, the original one too. That was very impressive. Very um, attention to detail. And I think that that kind of falls into... Um, both your videos and your your luthier side right now i, I kind of noticed that a lot with the videos the videos are have a lot of good stories like I, i'm I've, i'm watching them more for the story that sometimes than i am for the music at some points like i kind of get oh, lost in it uh, especially the the stop action animation one that one is that one just blows me away um okay let me hit you with three quick questions they're just fun stuff and i'll just throw them at you um your favorite video transition <laughs> yeah i don't know what they're called <laughs> I, if you're like me you know where they are on the menu bar but i never remember what they're called i don't know what they're called there's a okay what's it called it's like a zoom where i don't know what it's called it does this <laughs> that's perfect i get it no is it the one where the background kind of stays still with the zoom the front zooms or is that something different no i think it's different it's like a it's like a moving zoom uh blur oh gotcha okay yes yeah i've seen it in a couple of your videos okay so we'll, we'll call it the moving zoom blur we'll just call it that right, that's the one. um okay so knowing that you do different genres of music i this is this one hit me immediately we're talking about metal or rock music what voice do you like 80s falsetto standard metal like james hetfield screamo or growl uh metal james hetfield, hetfield, metal. James hetfield and for me hetfield and chuck billy are the two <sighs> ultimate metal singers i think they're amazing uh so i'm gonna tag a question on there just to hit me right now um well, i'm blanking on a blank on the guys belladonna for oh joey yeah joey do you think he really has a metal voice uh his whole thing was always he didn't want to be in a metal band he wanted to be like a Boston style band, which I love that. I love Joey Belladonna. Yeah. He is one of my favorites also. Me too. I but every I time I mention it to somebody about metal, they're like, ah, oh, he's not a metal singer. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Mm, <laughs> now listen to, no, listen to spreading the disease. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> among the living, he's going for it. Yeah, he is. Uh, sorry, that was a tag on question. That didn't actually count. Um, and the last one would be, um, what if you could do what your profession is making a video 
with a specific band? Is there a specific band you'd want to work with? Um, uh, I, I've one of my favorite metal bands has always been Death Angel. Wow, um, I they're local around here. Yeah, I've had lots of connections with them, and I've never done a video for them. Um, I've tried. I've, I've literally walked my demo reel to them at a show and said, "Let's do a video," and it just fell through oh, for whatever reason. No. I'd love to do a video for them. I don't know. I'd have to think. It 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 depends more on the song than the the band for me. So it, uh, I'll tag onto this one too. Is there a video that has inspired? Was there a video that actually inspired you to to move into doing metal? Was there like something that you saw that said that's kind of what I want to do? Or, or is it just the whole, you know, genre in general? I, don't, I never really cared about what genre I wanted to, to concentrate on. Okay. Um, but I was really good at doing metal videos, editing fast, the way I shoot. Like oh, it yeah. just all kind of came together to be a good mix for, for metal. Um, but uh, I was really, I loved all the directors in the early mid nineties, Spike Jones, oh, yeah. Chris Cunningham. Chris Cunningham is an incredible music video director. Like his aesthetic and everything he's done is amazing. The, um, uh, what's the band come to daddy is the, the music video. It's early nineties, mid nineties, maybe. Um, I can't remember the name of the, the group, or it's not even, it's one guy. Apex it's Twins? Like a, Ape, yes, Ape, Apex, Apex Twins, twin, yeah. Yeah, the Come to Daddy video was definitely an early one that I was like, oh my God. It Blue doesn't get any better. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> um, I love that video. Mike Sloat, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me. I love talking about people's history and music, and this was absolutely amazing. Um, where can people find you, what you do, you personally, if you want to put that on there too, where can they find you? Uh, it's all on mikesloat.com. Okay, perfect. My contact info, my luthier stuff, the videos, everything. Excellent. Um, again, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you for choosing Music Music. We hope this story not only gave you a little insight to what music means to someone, but it may also change how music fits into your life. So be sure and drop us a line at musicmusingfeedback at gmail.com and let us know your music story.